Good morning. Good morning. Hope everyone's doing well and everything's good. Another Sunday. Let's uh, <clears throat> let's go ahead and pray, and then uh, we will begin uh, this morning. Lord, thank you uh, for uh, just this morning. Thank you for uh, the sun. Thank you, Lord, for uh, good weather. Thank you, Father, for uh, the opportunity to be here and uh, to learn uh, your word um, in relative freedom. Thank you, God, that uh, uh, you have given us your word so that we may know the course of history and uh, where we fit and where we're placed in that course. And I pray, God, that this would be instructive for us and that uh, you would be glorified, Lord, as we seek to understand who you are and uh, your, uh, your outlining the future and things to come. We love you so much, Lord. We give you due praise for it's in your son's name. Amen. Amen. So uh, on the screen right now uh, is uh, our new counseling site. Um, there, it's actually an independence. That's where the, the main hub site is. Um, but our, our actual, but we're actually going to have a uh, kind of a satellite uh, room site here also, um, which is kind of fun. You pronounce it new, okay, not new, okay, or, or NYO, okay, it's new, it's the phonetic, it's the phonetic writing. Um, I think it's actually pretty cool. I was going to do new, but that was already taken, so I decided to do it phonetic. So if you uh, desire uh, counseling, even those online, too, we do uh, counseling online as well. So if you want counseling from a, a biblical perspective, um, explicit and implicit, uh, please go to my website or uh, type the number on the screen and uh, we will be able to get that to you. Now, enough of the shameless plugging. Let's go to Book of Revelation, Chapter 8. Chapter 8. We are uh, flying through some of this stuff here. Maybe not as fast as some, but that's okay. So we've, uh, we've ended Chapter 7. We've, take, we've taken a look at a couple of questions from Chapter 7, and we've answered them by looking at the text. Uh, plainly kind of going through and kind of uh, sightseeing and smelling the roses, if you will. And now we're going into chapter eight of Revelation. Just some things to review about chapter seven, um, as we always uh, do um, with these particular teachings, is uh, concerning the 144,000. We talked about this being national Israel and the preservation of a remnant throughout this uh, this period, right? And that these, uh, the number of these individuals is actual. Um, that uh, this is not a symbolic number. This is not a figurative number. Uh, these are actual individuals that have been, that will be preserved throughout the, um, the affliction and during this time. Um, we also uh, looked at the martyrdom of the Gentiles as well. If we read uh, chapter 7, verses 9 and following, um, we see a whole bunch of people from every tribe, tongue, language, and nation um, before the Lamb. These are individuals who came out of the great affliction, right? Um, they stood up against this false messianic kingdom, believing in the coming of the Messiah, the true Messiah, and helping those individuals during this time as well. And it cost them their lives as a result of it. Okay. And then lastly, we see the effect of this, the illusion of the language of the Old Testament. There are some uh, passages uh, in the language here. There are some passages that refer to Israel in the Old Testament concerning their destiny. Right. That they will be delivered and be brought to a place of peace and safety, that they will be brought to a place of justice and righteousness, and it, it would appear that the same language that is used of Israel in the Old Testament is used of these individuals. Now, that doesn't make these individuals here Israel, but it does underscore the destiny of these individuals, that their deaths are not in vain, right? That even though they've lost their lives 
uh, somewhat, why is this side just empty? It's not. Man, no, no, they walked in and sat down, and I saw, I was like, man, this is full, and this is just, I mean, you, you're, like, you're like voices in the wilderness. Glad to see you. Man, that's, that's interesting. Anyway, back to our regularly scheduled program. So um, these are uh, just because the language is in the Old Testament is consistent with the New Testament. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's the same group. In this context, we're talking about the same promise, the, the, the destiny of every saint to, to go into a place of security, of safety, and where the true Messiah reigns. That's the idea. Let's go to Revelation chapter 8, verses 1 to 3. Let's go ahead and read uh, this text, and then we will walk through this here. It says, when the Lamb broke the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and the seven trumpets were given to them. Verse 2, and another angel who had a golden censer came and stood at the altar, and a large amount of incense was given to him, in order that he could offer the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar that is before the throne. Remember, we've been uh, going through uh, some of these judgments of God, right? And we talked about the scroll at first. Let's rewind back there. And kind of look at uh, the seals of the scroll. We uh, looked at the fall that uh, this, the first seal is the is the false and rise of installation of a world conqueror, and as a result of this, we see hostility, the negation, and absence of peace. This is in contrast to Jesus, who will instill peace. This false Messiah won't instill peace. He will increase destruction. We see the rise of poverty and famine. On the earth as well, the death and the rise and carnage of individuals, the slaughtering of individuals, and the prayers of the saints that have been martyred during this particular time. And then, of course, we see the cosmic changes found on the scroll concerning uh, 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 the wrath of God and that individuals now recognize this. Okay. And they now see this and they begin to hide in caves and holes in the ground. Well, now we see the seventh breaking of this seal. We've come to this uh, particular time period. So one thing to note uh, at this point in Revelation chapter eight, John is still in the throne room. We still have not, we're not divorced from this scene here. Okay, this scene carries uh, consistently for, for, for a while. Okay? He's still there, present, observing the Lamb doing this. Well, how do we know this? Well, the breaking of the seal in verse 1, the breaking of the seals was seen throughout chapter 6. We just looked at that just a minute ago. And Jesus is still referred to the lamb in verse one. When the lamb broke the seventh seal, right? There was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. We see the first mention of the lamb in the book of Revelation, which is found in chapter five. Now, I know that we already know this, right? But because of the chapter breaks, we've, got, we've grown accustomed to seeing the text out of the scenery, right? Because we're used to taking passages out of context, right? Sometimes to prove points or sometimes to lay down systematic theology, which is okay in some respects. But it's very important for us to see this as a, as a continuing scene, as a continuing picture, okay? So even though I'm going back and kind of looking at some of these stuff that we already know, it's for us to kind of link these chapters together rather than seeing them in separate breaks, Okay, which are not found in the original uh, text, by the way. Again, these 
These chapters were added later. Let's go to Revelation chapter 5, verse 5. We see the first usage of the lamb in this text. Revelation chapter 5, verses 5 and following. Then the elder said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion from the tri of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and break its seven seals. And I saw in the midst of the throne and, the, and, the, and of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders, a lamb standing as though slaughtered, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent to all the earth. And he came and he took the scroll from the right hand of the one who is on the throne. So we see this continuation of this scene where the lamb is taking the throne. He's breaking the seals. Right. And we also notice and observe in chapter six, the opening of the first six seals. We already discussed this. And the word lamb is used in several places. Revelation chapter six, verse one. Revelation chapter six, verse seven and chapter six, verse nine. All in all of these places, this word is used consistently to refer to Christ and him being worthy to take the scroll and break its seals. The lamb is also acknowledged in Revelation chapter 7 by the multitude of those who came out of the great affliction. We talked about this several weeks ago. In Revelation chapter 7 verse 9, we see uh, the mention of the lamb. After these things, I looked and behold a great crowd that no one was able to number from every nation and tribe and people and language standing before the throne and before the lamb, dressed in white robes and with palm branches in their hands. And they were crying with a loud voice saying, salvation to our God who is seated on the throne and to the lamb. So again, the first mention of the lamb is found in chapter five. We see uh, the mention of the lamb throughout chapter six. The lamb is acknowledged by the great, by the multitudes in chapter seven. And as you have in the last verse in chapter seven, that recognizes the lamb at the center of the throne in verse uh, 17 of this chapter. And because the lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and will lead them to springs of living waters. We talked about this, right? That the promise and hope of those who are found within this affliction is not lost. That a, a shepherd will lead them, right? And that shepherd is ironically the lamb. <laughs> so let's look, uh, let's go through, uh, uh, what is this half an hour thing? Well, again, it's kind of fun to kind of look at some commentaries here and see what they say, and then kind of see whether or not uh, they the commentaries fit what the text says. Um, let, before we do that, let's go ahead and read this text. Revelation chapter 7, verse 1. When the Lamb broke the seventh seal or chapter eight, verse one, there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. And I saw the angel, seven angels who stand before God and seven trumpets were given to them. Another angel came and stood at the altar holding a golden censer and much incense was given to him so that he might add it to the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints went up, for, went up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with the fire of the altar and threw it on the earth, or threw it to the earth. And there followed peals of thunder and sounds and flashes of lightning and an earthquake. Let's take a look at uh, a couple commentaries here. I added, I added your best friend. He's cool. Never trust a guy with two first names, right, as Willie B. says. 
Let's take a look at uh, what he says here. A profound silence in heaven for the space of a half an hour, which may be understood either in two ways. The silence of the silence of peace, that for this time no complaints were sent up to the ear of the Lord, God of Sabbath, all was quiet and well in the church. And therefore all silent in heaven. For whenever the church on earth cries through oppression, that cry comes up to heaven and resounds there. Or, number two, a silence of expectation were great things upon the wheel of providence. And the church of God, both in heaven on earth, stood silent as became them to see what God was doing. So Matthew Henry says the either two things apply. One, that all is well and quiet with the church. Or there's an expectation of great things on the wheel of fortune. No, I'm sorry, providence. Okay? And the church of God. Again, sounds good, but is this what he says the half an hour is, since we're examining that this morning. That half hour of silence is a terminus reaching all the way to eternity and summing up all had been revealed by the opening of the six seals. It is a crescendo to him. The finish, which disclosed conditions of the whole period between the two advents of Christ. This understanding of the silence forces the conclusion that whatever else may be revealed in Revelation covers identically the same time period that is covered by the opening of the six seals. So essentially, this is kind of the stopping and everything else that proceeds after this is the kind of the rewinding of the tape and filling in the gaps. That's kind of the idea. Okay. that we're going to see the same scenes that happen in the seals from a different angle, right? from a different perspective. Okay. Joseph Benson, he writes, and the time of this silence, being only a half an hour, it seems, was intended to signify that the peace of the church would continue for a short season only, which was the case, namely, during the last 15 years of Constantine's reign. I don't know how you get 15 from 30, except if you multiply it by two. But that's not what this individual says here. And we already know that in, Re that in Revelation chapter seven, it is, the, it, the, it is neither group is the church. Okay? So let's uh, let's continue here. What exactly is this half an hour thing? Well, let's take a look at a couple of words here. The word silence is the word sige. Okay? It is only found in one other place in the New Testament. Turn to Acts chapter 21, if you will. <laughs> I'll start at verse 37 for some context here. This is Paul uh, essentially bound and seized in the temple, this scene here. As Paul was about to be brought to the barracks, he said to the commander, may I say something to you? And he said, do you know Greek? Then you are not the Egyptian who some time ago stirred up the revolt and led the 4,000 men of, of the assassins out into the wilderness. But Paul said, I'm a Jew of Tarsus and Cilia, a citizen of no insignificant city. I beg you, allow me to speak to the people. When he had given him permission, Paul, in verse 40, standing um, on the stairs, motioned the people with his hand. And when there was a great silence, a great hush, he addressed them in the Ara Aramaic language, right? 
So here we have Paul addressing individuals, right? Uh, quieting a revolt, if you will. He's, he's motioning with his hands for people to, 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 be, to be silent so that he can address them and speak to them. And when it says, when he motioned with his hand to the people, there was a, a great sege, a great silence. Okay? There was no one talking, a, a hush. So it would appear that there was nothing, no activity going on at this particular time in Revelation chapter 8, verse 1, due to the text that says that there was silence in heaven for half an hour. Uh, this word, Hemi Orion, is uh, the term for half an hour. This is the only time this word is used in scripture, half an hour, Semi or Hemi Orion. Okay? This word, Hemi Orion, comes from two Greek words that are, that are kind of smooshed together. Uh, one word is hemesis. Okay? We should recognize this where we get the word hemisphere, right? It is used three times in the book of Revelation, and this word is translated half, hemesis, okay? The last word, uh, or, or, the, or the suffix, really, is the word hora, which is hour. This is used 106 times in the New Testament, and this term is used 10 times in the book of Revelation. Let's look at some of the usage of, this, of these words throughout the text. In Revelation chapter 11, verse 9. This is concerning the two witnesses in the book of Revelation, which we are going to get to here fairly quickly. When we look at the term half, we see this here. And those from tribes and peoples and tribes and language and nations will see their dead bodies for three and a half days. Hemesis. And they will not allow their dead bodies to be placed in a tomb. And those who live on the earth will rejoice over them and celebrate them and will send gifts to one another because the two prophets tormented those who live on the earth. And after three and a half days, that is emesis, the breath of life from God entered into them and they stood on their feet and a great fear fell on those who saw them. So we see this word is used twice in this text in chapter 11 to refer to uh, the celebration of individuals who have uh, essentially uh, overtaken these prophets of the Lord who have uh, tormented them with various plagues. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 14, this is an interesting chapter when we get here. It says, And the two wings of the great eagle were given to the woman, in uh, Revelation 12, we'll talk about who this woman is in order that she could fly into the wilderness to place her to her place where she where she's fed there for a time and times and half a time. Hemesis from the presence of the serpent. Again, don't worry about who the woman is. We'll talk about that later on. Okay. So what does this phrase mean? Is this phrase symbolic? Is it figurative? Does it mean that there is a time of tranquility and peace uh, for the church when there's silence? Does it mean that uh, 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 there's a wheel of providence that uh, God is uh, doing? Does it mean that uh, this is a period in time uh, that represents Constantine? Well, we'll come back to this question later, okay? So put in the back of your mind. We will answer this question, but there's some other things we got to do first. Let's uh, continue here. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and the seven trumpets were given to them. This is very fast here. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and the seven trumpets were given. Kai is the word for and. This is a conjunction. Here And this particular conjunction is used in verses 1 to 6 
six times chi. This is important because this links all of the other things that are happening. Okay? In verses one, in verse one, with the events found throughout verses two to six. Okay. So we have when this silence is here, we have the seven angels with the seven trumpets. And we have all these other details here that are listed in conjunction with this particular time. It says, and I saw, I observed the seven angels who stand before God and seven trumpets were given to them. Again, the seven angels are before God. As I mentioned before, this is still the scene in the throne room. We can't separate that from this going on. Okay? All of the stuff that John is seeing is taking place uh, from the scene that we found or that we saw in Revelation chapter 4. This is a continuation of that. Okay? And again, seven trumpets. Hep the sow pigs. We've seen this word, uh, hep, well, we've seen hepto too, but salpix we've seen also. As a matter of fact, if we turn to Revelation chapter 1, verse 10, this is the word for trumpet. I'll start at verse 9. And I, your brother with John, and fellow partaker in the, in the affliction and the kingdom of God and perseverance, which are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in spirit on the Lord's day. That's not in the spirit. I was in spirit on the Lord's day. And I heard behind me a great sound like a trumpet. And we talked about that word, that that word uh, is, not, is not a trumpet that you, you did in, in school. This is a sh like a shofar. Okay. In Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, uh, we hear uh, that the sound of this trumpet is connected to the voice of John, who uh, is uh, who's, uh, in invited to come up to heaven. Verse 4, or chapter 4, verse 1. After these things, I looked and behold, an open door in heaven and the former voice I had heard like a trumpet speaking with me saying, come up here and I will show you the things which must take place after these things. So we have seven angels with seven trumpets or seven uh, shofars. This is found within chat, uh, verse one of the silence in heaven. We read of another scene here of these seven angels who are standing with these trumpets that were given to them. They were handed these things. And then it reads in, uh, as we continue in chapter eight or chapter eight verses one and following, another angel came and stood at the altar holding a golden censer and much incense was given to him so that he might add to the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense and the prayers of the saints went up before God out of the angel's hand. Fascinating. You know, what's interesting is, is again, that the language, when John is observing all of these things, we have to keep in mind that John is not scratching his head wondering what these things are. He knows exactly what these are because John uh, is a good Jewish boy. Right? He's read the law and the prophets. He knows this and has seen these things before. This, uh, this scene kind of underscores uh, the altar of incense, which is underscored in Exodus chapter 30. Let's go ahead and turn there and take a look at Exodus chapter 30, verses 1 to 10. It mentions the altar, it mentions incense and the prayers of the saints as incense. Well, we see some similar language here in Revelation chapter 30. I'll start at verse 1. 
It says, moreover, you shall make an altar as a place for your burn, for burning incense. You shall make it of acacia wood, and its length, um, its length shall be a cubit, and its width a cubit, and it shall be square. And its height shall be two cubits, its horns shall be with one piece with it. And you will overlay it with pure gold, its top and sides all around and its horns, and you shall make for it a gold molding all around. And you will make two gold rings for it. Under its molding on two opposite sides, you will make them as holders for poles to carry, to carry it with them. You will make the poles of acacia wood and you will overlay them with gold. Verse six and seven. And you will put it before the curtain that is upon the ark of the testimony, before the atonement cover, which is on the testimony. For there, it, therefore there I will meet with you. And on it, Aaron will turn fragrant incense into smoke. Notice all the language here. It's very consistent with this. Each morning when he tends the lamps, he will turn it into smoke. And when Aaron sets up the lamps at twilight, he will turn it into smoke, an incense of continuity. Before Yahweh throughout your generations, you will not offer it on, on you will not offer on it strange incense. Strange incense is things that uh, incense that God has not uh, prescribed for this altar, right? Or a burnt offering or a grain offering. You will not pour a libation on it. You won't do that. That's not what this is for. This is not for sacrificing. This is not for burning alternative incense. This is not for you to uh, pour, uh, pour out, pour out, pour, pour out one for the dead homies. All right. Verse 10, and Aaron will make atonement on its horns one time in the year for the blood of the sin offering of the atonement. One time in the year, he will make atonement on it throughout your generations. It is a most holy thing for the Lord or for Yahweh. We see here the altar of incense, the priest taking uh, the incense and I'm pouring it on the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the flame here and turning it into smoke, which is exactly as prescribed by the Lord. We see the details of the incense that are described in chapters 34 to 36. If we jump down there. So we have the details of the altar of incense, but we also have the details of the incense itself. The Lord gives this to Moses also. It says, then the Lord said to Moses, take for yourself fragrant perfumes, stock today resin and onicha and galbanum, fragrant perfumes and pure frankincense, an equal part of each. And make it into a compound of incense, the work of a perfumer, salted, pure, and holy. Verse 36. And you will grind part of it into powder, and you will put part of it before the testimony of the tent of assembly where I meet with you, and it will be a most holy thing to you. This incense that they were to take equal parts of and grind, they were to put some aside, but also use it for uh, the fragrant offering. We even see some of this uh, uh, this language in Psalm 141 as well. This is an interesting uh, text here. Because in this psalm, the Psalter talks about the prayers being an incense, an aroma to the Lord. Psalm 141. David writes, O Lord, I call upon you, hasten to me, give ear to my voice when I call you. May my prayer be counted as incense, 
before you. The lifting up of my hands is the evening offering. David, using uh, the example of the incense before uh, the fragrant offering before the Lord, talks about that, underscores that his prayer, or at least his prayers, let his prayers be counted as incense. And then we have the censer. This is mentioned also, too, in Revelation chapter 8, that this, uh, this uh, angelic host has this censer uh, before uh, the Lord. Well, what's the censer? The censer is that, that little uh, container there that is held. As well as a, again, as this, as the as he is walking to uh, having this incense in his hand, uh, in his other hand, there is a small little censer, as well, which is mentioned also in Rebel in Exodus thirty. So, what does this all mean? Well, we see what this all means. Reading the text, another angel came and stood at the altar holding a golden censer, much like these priests. And much incense was given to him so that he might add it to the prayers of all of the saints on the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense, that is the prayers with the prayers of the saints, went up before the Lord out of the angel's hand. This is similar to, again, what the priests used to do with, these, with the fragrant offering. Okay? He's presenting this to God, these prayers. Well, then the angel took the censer, filled it with the fire from the altar, and threw it to the earth. What are these prayers about? And there followed peals of thunder and sounds and flashes of lightning and an earthquake. Again, I could imagine John looking at this and going, Ooh, oh boy. Because again, he's not scratching his head wondering what this is. He knows what this is. As a matter of fact, I would presume that when uh, he is detailing this, his mind reflects back to the Old Testament because there's something similar that happens like this, taking something and throwing, taking ashes or, 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 or fire from the altar and throwing it to the earth. There is a very similar scene that happens in the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 10. Let's take a look at Ezekiel chapter 10. And we'll start at verse 1. Ezekiel, writing this, he goes, I look and look. <laughs> so he's shocked here. And I looked and looked on the expanse that was above the head of the cherubim. Something like a stone of sapphire, and like in a, the appearance of the shape of a throne, it appeared above them. And he spoke to the man clothed in linen and said, Go in among the wheel area under the cherubim and fill the hollow of your hands with the coals of fire from among the cherubim and toss them onto the city. He went right before my sight. Again, this throwing uh, of these coals is representative of judgment. Very similar to this scene here in the Ezekiel, where he takes these coals, he's supposed to take it from the hollow of his hand and toss them onto the city is very similar to this angel in Revelation 8 taking uh, fire and th and from the censer and tossing it onto the earth. Uh, 
all of these qualities, that is the peals of thunder and sounds and flashes of lightning and the earthquake, are qualities that God uses when he appears in power and glory. The peals of thunder, the sounds, the flashes, the earthquake, this uh, represents them. As a matter of fact, this is very reminiscent, again, of Exodus. Exodus chapter 19, verses 16 uh, and following. We see a very similar, uh, kind of similar events here surrounding this text. And on the third day when it was morning, this is chapter 19, verse 16 of Exodus. And on the third day when it was morning, there was thunder and lightning and a heavy cloud over the mountain and a, and a very loud ram's horn sound. And all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. And at Mount Sinai was all wrapped in smoke because the Lord went down on it in the fire, and its smoke went up like the smoke of a smelting furnace. And the whole mountain trembled greatly. And the sound of the ram's horn became louder and louder. And, and as Moses would speak, and God would answer him with a voice. Huh. You know, it kind of makes me wonder. Individuals who say that they hear God's voice, they don't tremble very much. But that's another that's another lecture for another time. And the Lord went down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain and Yahweh called Moses to the top of the mountain and Moses went up. So we see that this peals of thunder and sounds and flashes of lightning and earthquakes and all of these things mark God's work and his activity. All of these qualities of God are used when he appears in power and glory. And all of these words, the lightning, the flashing, the peals of thunder, are also used when referring to God's judgment also. So, in all of these things, in the context, what does this phrase mean about a half an hour? We talked about that, right? Well, in reference to the context here, if we were to take this in its normal plain Jane language, there are no lexical indicators that underscore that this is a figurative period of time. So Constantine's out. It doesn't say for about a half an hour, mystically, allegorically, it doesn't say that. There are no uh, indicators that underscore that this is figurative. Two, there are no words within the context. Am I going out? Because I, I, I heard myself and then I didn't. Check. Well, that's every Sunday almost. <laughs> My mic was like, I can't take this. <laughs> Hello? Pam, the uh, audio fixer, is working through this. We're almost done, too. We got a couple more slides left, and then we're, we're finished. Mm -hmm. Check. I still have a green light, by the way. So I, I know it's not the batteries. Check. Can you hear me? Okay. Okay. So there are no lexical indicators that underscore that this is a figurative period of time. And there are no words within the context of the passage that point to some symbolic figure. You know, that, that, that word, uh, 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 there are no uh, like or as words here. There's no simile language as well. It doesn't say there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour uh, compared to this. So there, there's nothing like that. 
Three, the phrase is consistent with the normal use of time. When we look at the, even though this one, this phrase is the only time that it's used, the word hemesis and aura are, are, are used somewhat normally and plainly, depending on the context, right? And of course, there again, there are no symbolic language or anything uh, that that points us that that this is symbolic either. So really, half an hour means just that. This is a this is a normal period of time, okay? And it's the period of time where all of these in the these things coalesce. It stands to reason that based upon the overall context of the passage, that this silence is concerning the preparation of the trumpet judgments that are getting ready to commence because of the use of the conjunction that connects all these things together. We have the standing of the angels. You know, it's kind of like they're kind of standing, you know, guard ready to ready to blast their trumpets. We have the procession of the uh, of the angel before the before uh, God with this uh, uh, with the golden censer and the incense. It's not till after he throws the stuff onto the earth that things begin to start to rumble. But before then, it's all procession. It's preparation for the next phase of this particular activity of God. These events are the effect of the breaking of the seventh seal. As a matter of fact, you can say very plainly that the breaking of the seventh seal is essentially uh, the ramp up to the trumpet judgments. The silence for a half an hour coincides with all the events that John outlines. Again, this is consistent with the conjunction Chi. We just looked at this. These are all connected together. And lastly, the breaking of the seals is in concert with the, with the prayers given by the saints of the great affliction, as well as all of the saints coinciding with the, with, with the enemies, uh, smashing the enemies, things like this. This is, a, this is the culmination of this. We see this a little bit in Revelation chapter 6 with the breaking of the sixth seal. Oh Lord, how long will you withhold your judgments? And we see that God is now getting ready to respond to said prayers. What are these judgments of the trumpet? And what are their effects? We will talk about that next week. We'll begin to start to unpack those. Let's go ahead and pray, and then we will end our lecture this morning. Lord, the more that I read the book of Revelation, Lord, the more that I become so encouraged, so encouraged of a couple of things, that one, the world system and the things that we live uh, and the system that we live under is not worthy of us at all because it rejects you. But two, the affliction that individuals suffer with, especially during this time, Lord, they, have, they need not fear because there's great hope. We, I thank you so much, Lord, that you are a God who is just, that you are a God as well as being just as also merciful. But just nonetheless, we thank you, Lord, that you have revealed this to us and that you have made it plain for us to understand. John is not writing to confuse us or to confuse those who will read this in the future, but he's writing this with the perspective that things are hard. They are tough, but there is hope. And we thank you for that. May we continue to think about the future. And in doing so, Lord, may we be encouraged as believers in Christ to know that there is great hope for us as we uh, wait for our Savior's appearing. 
but at the same time, too, for those who will be behind, may they read this and see great hope, knowing that God is gracious and that um, you are indeed true. We love you so much, Lord, and we give you due praise, for it's in your son's name. Amen.